the 17th century and the church is in trouble. Split in two by the Reformation, Protestants in the north and Catholics in the south. And the lift changed painting forever. The Reformation sent Rome reeling. It exposed to the church its spiritual failure. And thank God, it set mea culpa and set about trying to do better. It began to see that painting could be a way of inspiring and invigorating people's faith. Art of immense exuberance and strength would arise from the ashes. And the technical name for this is Art of the Baroque. Rome is the place for the Baroque. It was the Pope who insisted that the church must use painting and sculpture to bring people closer to the drama and truth of the Bible stories. Baroque art entices the human senses to lead people to a religious awareness. It's not easy to make religious art both dramatic and relevant to the lives of ordinary people. But Rome's Baroque genius, the painter Caravaggio, makes it seem easy. Take his first church commission, where he painted three scenes from the life of St. Matthew, translating the Bible stories into the language of his own Rome. And typical of the man, he didn't compromise. He painted exactly the kind of painting that shows why he had such a tremendous influence on the story of painting. It's absolutely real, it's dynamic with, with drama, and he's using light and shade like a theatre director, using a spotlight to control the actions. St Matthew was a tax collector, which in those days was an immoral, almost mafia-like type of job, so unlike our own dear Inland Revenue. And he wants to show this sleazy, money-obsessed world by using extravagant contemporary costumes. So, one moment, an ordinary moment in a rather decadent office, then everything changes. The door opens and Christ and St. Peter come in. Barefoot, barehead, totally different values. Only Matthew realizes this is his chance to escape from all the immorality and the rat race and to get out into a new kind of life. And because Caravaggio is such a personal kind of artist, I've always wondered if the great force of this picture doesn't come from something that happened to him. If at some moment he hadn't had this electrifying chance and unlike St. Matthew, turned it down. How Caravaggio must have yearned to escape his problems. He led such a riff-raff, disordered life. And mixed with a seedy, low-life crowd. Brawls, punch-ups. He once caused a riot in a restaurant by throwing a plate of artichokes in the waiter's face. It's tempting to think that it was this violent lifestyle that gave his paintings this exciting and gritty realism. Even his Greek gods have the look of rent boys, while others are more like wasted alcoholics. But Rome is not all back streets and gloom. It's full of light and grandeur. And another, less hard-hitting side of the Baroque reflects this. This is the side which gives the customer just what he wants. Take the Farnese Gallery, a Baroque secret, dense with splendor. 
now hidden away in the French embassy. The artist Annabali Karachi doesn't trouble us with a whiff of serious emotional meaning or pious feeling. Just boisterous mythologies, cheerful chubby cherubs, and a liberal sprinkling of alluring female flesh. Look at Jupiter and Juno. There's Juno, seducing her own husband with those rather obvious breasts. And Jupiter's mooning over her like a besotted salmon. And it was all painted, I'm sorry to say, for a cardinal. There were three influential artists in the Karachi family, but they were all outshone by one of their pupils, the much sought-after Guido Reni. This is the death of Cleopatra, the great queen of Egypt, the most beautiful woman in the world. She lost her war against the Romans. And the custom was to take the captives to Rome and display them. And she couldn't bear it. Her pride couldn't take it. She felt she had no option but to kill herself. And sensuous to the end, she asked a servant to bring in a basket of flowers and fruit and hide within it an asp, because she'd been told an asp was the most painless way to die. It would sting you, and you'd just go to sleep. And here you can see it happening. One soft hand lingering so lovingly on that basket of flowers and fruit. The world, she does not want to leave, but feels she has to. And the other, so delicately, just holding to her breast, the brown curve of the serpent. And if you look, you can see she still has pink in her cheeks and those lustrous eyes turned to heaven with a tear in them are still alive and sparkling and she, her, her lips are still red and, and voluptuous. But then she gets a pearly white as if she's dying visibly before us. Now she gambled. She gambled on winning against the Romans, and she'd lost. And we know practically nothing about Rainey's emotional life. He seems to have loved nobody, man or woman, but he was an inveterate gambler. And I feel he understood this, entered wholly into her despair and her loss and her need to take drastic measures. And he paints it so beautifully and movingly. While Rainey lived, he eclipsed all other artists. It was only after his death that another of the Karachi school, Guercino, could step out of his shadow and into the light. The rich and powerful queued up to buy his work, but his name doesn't reflect the respect they felt. Guercino is a nickname. It means squinty but no one ever squinted to better artistic effect. 